tonight, the Katsi Trilogy, a vision of filmmaker Godfrey Reggio. Our problem is that with technology, we've developed an infinite tool that works in a very finite world. That's called, we, we have a term for that. It's called progress and development. That's our new religion. And an artist profile of Francisco Lefebvre and Bernadette Rodriguez. I enjoy working with Francisco. I still like certain tones together, and, and sometimes he doesn't, but uh, we're able to work OK. I mean, it's been 14 years now. Coming up next on Colores. This evening, we will meet a New Mexico filmmaker who makes a very different kind of film. His first two motion pictures were neither classic documentaries nor works of pure entertainment. Instead, he likes to make movies, he says, that one can absorb, that one can take in through the pores of their bodies. Movies, in other words, that are an experience. Godfrey Reggio has made two hugely successful movies that combine striking metaphoric photography with the primal music of composer Philip Glass. There are no characters, no storyline, no dialogue. The first film was quite a surprise and received great critical acclaim for its unique style and powerful message. Of this work, Reggio says, it's a film with no words about the power of one word. That single powerful word is the film's title, Koyonis Gatsi. It's a Hopi Indian word that means life out of balance. Reggio remarks that with that film, he wants to make a movie about the beauty of the beast. A movie that celebrates freeways, 747s, even the bomb. Because the beast, he says, doesn't come as a bum or a bag lady. It comes full of enticements. And he thinks that we've already taken a bite out of it. 
Koyonoskazi is the first of a trilogy planned by Reggio that deals with how humankind has placed its unquestioning, almost religious faith in the power of human technology, replacing the natural world with artifice. Powak Katsi is the name of the second film. It too is a Hopi word that means life in transition. work, Reggio uses the high gloss of the film medium to, quote, heighten consciousness and imagination, to open our eyes again, to look at what we've stopped seeing. Our salvation, he says, depends on reawakening, on being reminded of the human condition. Without question, Godfrey Reggio is a different kind of filmmaker motivated by deep sensitivity and sense of purpose. His motion pictures are both works of art and acts of conscience. It seems real clear to me that there's a deep irony in your use of a highly technological medium to reveal the negative impact of technology on human life. My intention is to teach people in terms of what they already know all of us are saturated in media world. It's the only thing we know. So I can't, in a miraculous way, communicate my idea to a person, obviously. And I want to provide an experience for the viewer, so I use these tools. And I use them in a way almost like a cultural kamikaze. I, I don't feel invested in the tool, but I feel like if I'm going to try to communicate to the contradiction of a mass audience that I have to use those tools. So I know that I'm walking on a very thin line and I'm, I'm gratuitously and freely embracing that contradiction. The contrast between Hopi and Hollywood it is obviously a profound one. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Let me put it this way, it's not only Hopi in Hollywood, it's Hopi in academic, it's Hopi in modernity, mm -hmm. it's Hopi in the modern world. Uh, the concepts for the films, for the trilogy, have been my own and my associates. The connection to Hopi was one, for us, of a very important confirmation that um, I felt very much confirmed in my thought about what I was seeing by the metaphysics, if you want, of Hopi. Let me use an analogy. If an anthropologist were to study the Hopis or to study the Navajos or the Pueblos or Indians in this area or anywhere, they would use their own categories of observation in order to render some judgment about the nature of these indigenous societies. What I did was, in effect, take the Hopi category of looking at us as the alien, mm -hmm. the the inhabitants of modernity, as it were, and applied their categories, since they were confirming of my own points of view, in terms of time and space. Let's take, for example, in Koyanis Katsi. We see things in, in the technological sense, uh, in terms of the camera pixelated or in time lapse shot so that the image looks very fast. We're actually shooting very slow, the image looks fast. What that does is give us another, another view of time, another way to see a concept, perhaps, something that we take for granted. What we're trying to do in Koyanis Katsi is show that we're living in, an ex in a world that's, that's engulfed in acceleration. So that's a category of observation that the Hopi can view our culture through. It's not something that would occur to us. We, we go through a progression of time, past, present, and future, uh, uh, in a very linear way. Everything exists in a moment for Hopi. Um, there's the, uh, the past, present, and future as an eternal now, another sense of time altogether. I tried to weave that as a concept in the two films I've done so far. So the, the reason for choosing these, these people is that they offered us something that perhaps we've not seen because we're too close to. You know, one of the obvious uh, uh, qualities that are missing in these movies is a, is a heavy moral overtone. And for movies with this kind, with the profound kind of message and the sort of uh, pointedness of your message, uh, 
Is there a heavy moral overtone in, well, that's in a, the Hopi worldview? Well, I can't speak for the Hopi, and so I don't know that. Um, I, I do feel essentially the films I make are moral. I don't feel they're moralistic. I'm not trying to tell someone what to think or how to think or point there. Like if you watch a commercial, your, your head is almost like being guided mm -hmm. by the hand of the producer of the commercial because they want you to see things. I'm trying to leave it as open so a person can view and see for herself what's being offered in the film so that they can judge for themselves. It would be like seeing a painting. If there were 30 people in a gallery and looking at a specific painting, there might be 30 different points of view. Mm -hmm. If 100 people come to see these films in any given night, there could be 100 different points of view because the viewer is free to perceive for herself or himself the nature of the experience that they're having. Why Hopi worldview? Well, they, see, everything that we call normal, they call abnormal. Everything that we call sane, they call insane. That's how I feel. I believe that we live in a world where the moment of the truth is actually the moment of the false, where we are so close to the, to the ordinariness of daily life that we don't see how crazy life is. In terms of our concept, which is how we live, I think a lot of us feel it. You can see it in the tension, you can see it in the conflict, you can see it in people that need to escape life through drugs or through any other form, maybe work, other activities. But what you can tell instinctually is that something is very un imbalanced or stressed. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the Hopis and other Indians, not just Hopis, other indigenous people are aware of that. They can see that white people, what they call white people, or people that live in industrial zones, are disconnected from their heart, or disconnected from their head, or living a synthetic life. That's why I chose these, these prophecies, this inspiration, going to a Hopi source. We don't we don't know their language. It has no baggage for us. I'm in effect trying to create an iconography of a hundred minutes of image in order to give you a view of the power of one word. Everyone has a hard time saying these words and really knowing what they mean. Could you describe them? And, 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 and Certainly. What I'm embarked on is a task of trilogy in terms of filmmaking. The first film of the trilogy is Koyanis Katsi. Koyanis Katsi means essentially life out of balance, life disintegrating, crazy life, life in turmoil, but more principally a way of life that calls for another way of living. It's a view of the industrial zone. It's a view of the northern hemisphere and how we live in a process of density, acceleration, mobility, critical mass out of control. Powakatsi is a film that's shot principally in the southern hemisphere. Powakatsi means an entity, a being that eats, consumes the life forces of other beings in order to enhance its own life. What's clearly involved here is black magic. What's clearly involved here is negative transformation through the process of consumption. So what this film deals with is consuming indigenous cultures which make up perhaps 65% of the world's population through the seduction, through the myth, through the life force of the industrial technological world which, po which Koyanis Katsi tried to show. Nakoi Katsi, the third of the trilogy, which is in progress now. Nakoi means war, Katsi means life. It's about life as war, but not war in any way limited to the battlefield. War as a way of life, war as the price we pay for the pursuit of our own technological happiness, war as the price we pay for affluence, mm. war as a sanctioned aggression against the forces of life. Is there, is there an overarching view that ties all these up? The motivating concept for the trilogy is the nature of the technological universe or the technological order or the technological milieu in which we live. If I were to say that nuclear war, uh, environmental devastation, the debt crisis, drug abuse, child abuse, the abuse of women by men, et alia, all of these fantastically horrible problems, these problems are surface, from my point of view, mm. compared to what I'm trying to look at in the trilogy. The focus of the trilogy essentially deals with something as awesome and as unprecedented in certainly our history and certainly the history of the globe as the death of nature. What this, what this trilogy is trying to show is that 
nature itself is, is dead in terms, in, in its relation to us as the host of life. Now, when I say that we have environmental devastation, I believe that those things that are destroying the environment can be taken care of by high technology, but it would do nothing to eliminate the death of nature as the host of life and its replacement with the new host of life, which is the technological milieu, or the technological order. Now, I realize in saying this to you, to the audience that's watching us tonight, that I might sound like I've taken leave of my senses. I think the concept is so foreign to the way we perceive the world that we have almost no terms in which to grasp this. When, when I talk about the death of nature and its replacement with the new host of life, that which we live our life on now as the technological milieu, I want to give it some characteristics. It's characterized by being artificial. It's not, it's not part of nature per se. It's something, it's artifice that we create. Look at any big city as the example. It's characterized by being autonomous in nature, irrespective of our ideas, of our concepts, of our values, and of the workings of the state itself, the nation itself. It has an autonomous nature. It's what Mary Shelley was talking about in her book Frankenstein, yes. not Hollywood's version. No, no, no. In being autonomous, it also acts like nature. It's a closed circuit. It has, it, it, it has a complete universe unto itself, and which does not omit of human intervention. So it, it, it's a closed system like nature. It replicates nature. It's an artifice of nature. It, it's also causal, in, but it's not causal in response to ends. It's the triumph of means over ends. It's, in, in that sense, it's self-deterministic. It has its own determinism wrapped in. And, and finally, it's, it's so comprehensive and so total that we have no perspective, usually, from which to judge it. So nothing can be viewed in isolation. You can't, we, we can't take care of the environmental problem and assume that everything is going to be fine, as many environmentalists would think. Or we can't take care of the, over, the population problem or the problem of adverse relation between the sexes or drug abuse or war. All of these things are mutually implicated in the technological milieu that we call life today. This what, is the crisis. What do we do? Well, it's, the first thing is to become aware that we no longer live with nature. We live above nature. Our view of nature is to consume nature, is to eat nature. Nature is raw material. To go back to the Indians, the Indians have an insight, a wisdom, a metaphysics that is much wiser than ours. They know that the earth itself is a living entity. They know that the earth has a life cycle that is delicate and must be protected. They also know of the danger and the, the ravaging of the earth against human beings, but they know that there must be some delicate balance respect between these entities. Our problem is that with technology, we've developed an infinite tool that works in a very finite world. That's called, we, we have a term for that. It's called progress and development. That's our new religion. And it's that that we must be aware of, I feel. The second is a process of revisioning. Before there can be activity, there must be a motivating vision. Religion has played that role for human beings. I'm, su I'm suggesting that the vision that we need for our day is one that rec is not anthropomorphized, one that doesn't put the human being, man more particularly, as the center of the universe. Our Bible tells us this, our Koran tells us this, our religion tells us this. This is something we have to question. Our faiths unquestioned can become our prisons. We have to, in effect, create a new vision that sees that not only as human being, a principal life form upon this host, but the planet itself is a life form, and that all other species are a life form. In that triadic, in that three-form relationship of respect for life, we can develop a new vision of life. I could go on. We could yeah. decentralize the, the mechanisms of the nation state, but this is a longer conversation.
was raised in northern New Mexico, and I've been in Albuquerque for almost 20 years now. I uh, was educated in South America as well, so I have a sensitivity for uh, Central and South American culture as well as American. Well, I was born and raised in Wagamon, New Mexico, which is in the northeastern part of the state of New Mexico, and uh, I uh, went to school there. I went to New Mexico Highlands University, and then I studied art in Mexico City, and I've lived in Albuquerque for um, about 18 years now. I enjoy working with Francisco. Uh, yes, there are tense times, but uh, it's, it's wonderful because there's some, some great discussion that comes out of that, and, and sometimes we resolve things, sometimes we don't. I still like certain tones together, and, and sometimes he doesn't, but uh, we're able to work okay. I mean, it's been 14 years now. The Campanias de Acoma painting, I think, is a strong piece because I use a light and dark, uh, positive, negative space uh, image in there. And then it's, it's seemingly flat, but there are also some detail pieces to that, the, the bells, the, the, the windows, the arches, that kind of give it definition and, and pull it apart from itself. You have to look at that very closely, I think. I like to work with light a lot and the images that light creates, specifically the stained glass image on the one portrait of Leticia and the play on uh, body contour and light. I think that's a, a fascinating uh, look at painting and light, which are two very important and necessary elements. I like to paint paintings of Frida Kahlo because I think Frida as, a, as an image is a very powerful one. I think as a, as a feminist in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, as an image, I think it, it's magnified through the kind of work that I do. The, the image I paint of her uh, relates a lot, I think, to the kind of work that she did. I think she was a very strong person and I enjoy painting people like that. Sometimes whenever I get a chance, I go to the West Mesa and I look down to the city and, and, and I, and I kind of look at Albuquerque and say, this is my town. <laughs> to me, Albuquerque is what maybe uh, uh, Florence was to Michelangelo. It's, it, I, I have a, a lot of uh, love for this town and, and that painting is done with that in mind. Wagamon will always have a very important part of my of my heart, you know, because that's where I grew up, that's where I, uh, I, sh I had a lot of fun memories. At some point or at some time in your life, you have to go to Chimayo, to the Santuario, and it also has that, that sort of uh, respect or that sort of uh, recognition. And then there's a, a series that I've, that I've started working on, on now uh, called uh, Mujeres Caballeras, a, a homage to women, uh, feminist women. And, and they're, let's say, more or less, uh, I think it could be also be said, you know, in terms of women who are riding the wind, but in, in my case, it's women who are conquering things or accomplishing things. And I, and, and I, and I use uh, the horse as a metaphor to, to define that. Lots of times, Bernadette will criticize the, the design and say it's too busy, you know, and I say, well, it's supposed to be busy, you know, I mean, you're supposed to see something in there. And, and, and sometimes I get very defensive, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, in terms of, uh, well, you know, this is the way I want it, you know, I mean, this is the way I like it, and it's just, but I don't, you know, well, it's too bad, you know, I mean, you know. Well, sometimes we get territorial, uh, sometimes with studio space. Uh, somebody needs a palette knife and it, it it's mutual property, but there are times when I, I'm not too thrilled about a bunch of uh, old oil billup on there, and, and I want my palette knife now and my space. And I think it, 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 it adds to growth, too. <laughs> 
For a video cassette copy of this Colores program, send $29.95 plus $3 for shipping and handling to KNME TV, 1130 University Boulevard Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87102, or call 1-800-328-5663.